Lord family, how's everybody doing tonight? So good to be with you in your living room, your bedroom, the kitchen, wherever you may be watching right now. We're just glad to be with you. Uh, my name is Pastor Cato Brown. I am the assistant pastor here at Charlotte Baptist Church, where the Reverend Dr. James A. Duncan is the senior pastor. And this is our Bible study night. We're so glad to be able to come wherever you are to share with you. Uh, last week we started uh, on a, a lesson called the triple threat. The triple threat. Uh, fighting the triple threat. I'm sorry. Fighting the triple threat. And the triple threat that we're discussing is depression, which we discussed last week. So you have to go back, check out that video. Uh, a lot of people looking at it and apparently it is it's helping some people. I hope it is uh, because that's why we do what we do. Amen. That's why we do what we do. Um, and tonight we have anger we're going to discuss. And the last of the triple threat would be fear, which will be our next class next week. Amen. So uh, I don't want to dilly down here. I just want to get right into it, if you don't mind. I just want to sit down with you at your, at your coffee table or, or around your kitchen table and just you and I having a conversation. Okay. It's just you and I and God talking tonight. Because uh, I believe that one of the greatest threats against our own spiritual well-being and even our physical well-being is these three triple threats. I believe that tonight anger is something that is that we see throughout our, our, our communities today. That's why we have gun violence on the rise. That's why we have uh, all this hate of uh, racial, uh, all kinds of uh, Things going on where we see mass shootings and everything else is because we have unresolved things going on that cause people to act out in anger, drive-by shootings and road rage. All this is starting to really swell in, in, our, in, our, in our homes, our neighborhoods, uh, around our, uh, our country, and even across the globe. We have folk that just don't know how to control their tempers. Amen? So we're gonna pray, we're gonna go into the lesson, we're going to discuss, amen, we're going to discuss, you know, mentally, spiritually, since I'm not there with you, but let's pretend we're having a conversation, amen? So get your pens out, get your Bible out, and because and, you're going to want to take some notes on this, amen? I'm not going to try to holler, I'm just going to try to talk to you, we're conversating, amen? So let's pray, let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you again. We ask now that you would speak to our hearts and minds that you help us to hear your engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. Lord, we bind every spirit in this place that wants to stop the word from coming forth. We bind everything that wants to keep us from being able to hear your engrafted word. We bind everything that wants to stop us from not just hearing, but doing, because it's in the doing where the blessing comes. So, Lord, I pray you bring back everything to remembrance that we've already talked about. And, Lord, may whoever's listening, wherever they're listening, when they're listening, that they find something that they, they, they can really latch on to, to help them to overcome this spirit of anger. Lord, we thank you. I humble myself before you and your people. Use this vessel to you. Lord, forgive me anything I said or done is not right in your sight. I thank you and give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As I said, uh, anger is one of the triple threats. And what, what I mean by triple threats, it's a toxic emotion. A toxic emotion. This toxic emotion is, excuse me, y'all. No, I got to turn my phone off. Uh, it's a toxic emotion to where it can really not just do damage to you physically or mentally, it can do damage to you physically, spiritually, relationally. Damage can, you can be damaged by just carrying anger consistently. Let me let me uh, read to you what I, what I type, type down here. Anger is one of the three toxic emotions that can hurt you and, and those uh, and those around you. Emotions, see, it doesn't. It's toxic, so it doesn't just hurt you. It hurts those around you. It can infect your children. It can infect your spouse. It can infect your your relationships on your job, your in fact, relationship with best uh, close friends. Close friends have divided, have, have separated, disconnected from one another because of anger. Unresolved, watch this, most of the time anger is unresolved pain. Somebody's going through something and don't know how to properly 
deal with so they lash out in by in anger to 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 try to defend themselves even in times when there is no reason to fight amen somebody amen so here we find that uncontrolled anger can destroy relationships your health and anything it touches anger can be a killer metaphorically and literally i don't have time to get into the, all the the uh, physical things that 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 anger can cause it, but I can tell you a couple, it can cause uh, um, hypertension, it can cause you to have heart problems, it can cause you to have uh, physical uh, joint pain, pain and everything else, and stomach issues because of uncontrolled, unresolved anger. Hope you're hearing me. Amen? So uh, anger is like jet fuel to an F-14 fly, a fighter plane. Anger is like gas to a Formula race car. Anger is like the rocket fuel needed to propel the space shuttle into space. Anger is energy that can do great good or cause severe damage. Hear what I'm saying? Anger is a fuel. Anger is a fuel that gives you the, the ability, the strength to do some things. But oftentimes, we have misplaced or misused anger, misused strength, and we oftentimes lash out in ways because we are upset about things that may not even be pertaining to what's going on in the, at the moment. It's just because, it's because we have not resolved some issues. I want to talk about that tonight. Amen? So, uh, it's good to remember that anger can become a controlling spirit and will attempt to keep you in bondage. You better hear me. A controlling spirit that will attempt to keep you in bondage. Subsequently, you are in bondage to whatever or whoever consistently makes you angry. In other words, if the sister on the job can get you upset, if it's your mama that can get you upset, every time they say something that you don't like, you are in bondage to the person who just made you upset. I hope you're going to let that sink in a little bit. They are actually controlling your behavior because you're not allowing yourself to release some things, let some things go, and say, I'm not going to let you get me upset anymore. It is your choice. You better hear me. It is your choice. So whether or not you're going to allow someone or something to get you so upset that you, you do things that you know aren't right. I know what I'm talking about. Before I used to be such an angry person, every time somebody looked at me, said something wrong, I would get angry. Those individuals were controlling my behavior. I did not realize it until I came to the Lord that I was under control by the enemy, and the enemy wanted to act out in such a way that I ended up either dead or in jail. It wasn't but the grace of God that kept me where I am, that got me to the place where I am. I hope you're hearing me. Amen? So this is some things you need to know. First thing, to know that anger is not always sin. Anger is not always sin. Do you hear me? There's two types of anger in the Bible, all right? The first one is what we call righteous indignation. Somebody say righteous indignation. Amen. The Bible says on the Psalm 7 and 11, God is angry. God is a righteous judge, a God who displays his wrath every day. God is angry with the wicked every day. Why? Because they constantly... They're going in a direction that opposes him, even though he created the earth, even though he gave them everything that they have, even though he allowed the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. He allowed the sun shine on those who, made, who are wicked and those who are right with him. He, he grants them grace. That's why they're here still. They have grace. God has granted them mercy. And still, they don't reciprocate any of that love that he has for them. They do not give it back. So God says, I'm angry with them. Every day. You ever hear me? And God, who is a judge, righteous judge, he knows why people do what they do. So if he's angry with them because he knows what their thoughts are, he knows how their hearts are, he knows why they, why, they, why they stray away from him, he knows why they do not come towards him or come to him, it's because of the sin that's, been, that's, that's in them and their, watch this, desire not to come to him. Their desire to stay away from God. So Psalm 711 gives us an insight to God's anger over the, over the wicked. But look what he says here also in 
Mark uh, 3 and 1 to 5. Let's look at how Jesus, in one situation, that Jesus was angry. Jesus was angry, and he displayed his anger in a very uh, uh, um, in a, 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 a outward display to show that he was angry. Amen? I'm, I'm telling you this because some folk would tell you that you're wrong if you get angry. It's not being angry. It's why you get angry. Amen? It's, it's a reason. It should be a reason why you get angry. Let's look at uh, uh, Mark chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. And it says, another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them uh, were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. In other words, there were those who were spiritual leaders, the Pharisees and scribes, were following Jesus around, and they had a set up a prop. The prop was this man with a withered hand. A shriveled hand. And so they wanted to see what Jesus was going to do because it was the Sabbath. They wanted to see so they can find something to accuse him of. Now notice what Jesus did. He says, uh, he says some of them were looking for him, looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see what he would see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. He said, I, I want, I'm going to put this on full display. I know, what, I know what they want. I know why they want it. And I'm going to show them something that in spite of your feelings, in spite of how you may hate me, I don't care because this man's, his need is greater than, your, than your, your feelings. His need is greater than your feelings. It's, his need is greater than your, than your hate for me, is what Jesus was basically showing them. Right? So, come up. Get in front of all of them. That's verse 3. And then Jesus said, verse 4, then Jesus asked them, he asked them a question. Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. They remained silent. They could not, they would not say anything. Why? Because first of all, they felt Jesus was beneath them. Amen. There's some folk in your life who get you upset. And they figure they can do what they want, say what they want, because they feel you're beneath them. Amen. But notice who they thought was beneath them, the God of all creation. Amen. You have to get to a place where you don't care how people feel about you, what they think about you, because every time you start feeling a certain way, they take advantage of that, and that causes you to become angry. And watch this. When you become angry, they turn to look at you. Don't you say, look at you. You don't even know how to act. Look at you. Any little thing can cause you to go off. Think about that for a minute. Amen? So he said, he said this. He looked around at them in anger. This was Jesus, verse 5. He looked at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. Jesus understood why they did what they did, used this man as a prop, and Jesus was angry. He, angry. he was upset. Amen? He had righteous indignation. And he said, he told the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out. And his hand was completely restored. And in those, well, we went to verse 6. Verse 6 says, Then the Pharisee went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. The religious group came along with the political group, and they decided they were going to figure out how to get Jesus. Jesus knew what was going to happen after he had healed this man's hand. But his anger, his righteous indignation, and the man's need called for him to do something about the man's condition. You better hear me. You see, every now and then, you should get angry enough when you see people impoverished, people who are homeless. You may see people who have a need that you have the ability to fulfill. Uh, instead of sitting there looking at them and saying, oh, how they get there, or look at them, they need to find a job. Every now and then, you should get upset enough to say, we need to do something about this. It was, it came, I don't remember the, the time of the year when it happened, but um, a group of mothers got sick and tired of watching their kids being ran over, killed by drunk drivers. Right? They got, they, they got tired of it. They said, we're not going to sit here and let another child die while you keep letting off these individuals who get, in, get behind a vehicle, get in the seat of a car, turn the key, and then drive impaired because they're drunk. And then you say, well, they were impaired. They were impaired. They didn't mean to kill them, but they should have never got behind the wheel in the first place. 
So they developed this group called MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. They were mad enough to do something about it. That's the fuel, that's the energy that anger brings whenever you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. You do something about the condition and the state that other people might be in. When, if you look at these verses that we're going to look at, take time to read them, you'll find out that any time Jesus got mad, it wasn't about something that he said about him. It's about the way they treated other people. I hope you're hearing God gets upset, and he wants us to get upset when other people are being messed with, other people are being looked down upon, other people are not getting the things they need. Amen. It doesn't matter where they come from, race, creed, or culture. It doesn't matter what, what a, what their, their sexual preference. It shouldn't matter. If they're a human being, we ought to be concerned about their state and condition. And it should get us angry when we see somebody being uh, misused, someone being put in a position where they have to feel like they're less than. Amen. So, let's look to the next thing. Uh, the Bible tells us it's acceptable for believers to be angry. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Why? Because it do not, watch this, the man's anger does not work the judgment of God, as it says in James. But it also says here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 and 27, 27 says, and do not give a devil, the devil a foothold. Anytime we, we allow, watch this, unjust, unrighteous anger to control us, and we go and we trip into sin because we're angry, we're giving the devil a place of access to, to watch this, touch our lives, and then eventually start put, setting up a foothold, meaning that he has some place to stand, and then he starts to build from where he's standing. What he wants to do is build a stronghold in your life, but it must start with a foothold. And that's just a place where he can go and get some stability and that he can start going to work. Understand this, anytime we allow anger to go unchecked, uncontrolled, we're telling the devil, come on, you can come on in and do what you want. You better catch that one. We're just talking, we're having a conversation. I want you to understand that. You're telling the devil it's okay to come into your house and start taking over. Because you allow uncontrolled, unjust, unrighteous anger. Now the Bible says it's okay to be angry, but what's the motivation behind it? And don't let it sit for long. Don't let it linger. The problem is we like to carry this thing. Amen. We get mad about something at home. We carry that, we carry that anger to the job. Then something on the job gets us upset. The next thing you know, we carry what was at home and what's on the job. Now we go to the church and we go, we go to the supermarket, we go to Walmart, we go to a, a Wawa. And once we get there, all of a sudden that same anger that we did not resolve at home, that anger we did not resolve at the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, um, at work, the anger we did not resolve in uh, the Wawa, all that's starting to swell up. All that's starting to come is starting to watch this mount up, up on one another. And before you know it, you're walking around with all this unresolved stuff. And before you know it, if you don't release it, there's going to be an explosion. There's going to be an explosion. And you may explode at the wrong time. Hear what I'm saying? Anger is a devilish, sinful, or watch, watch this, it can be a devilish, sinful spirit that can cause you to become something that you're not and place you in a position that you didn't want to be in. It can take you too far and keep you too long before you realize that you don't know who you are and why you are. Because unchecked anger. It's not wrong to be angry if it's a righteous anger. It's not wrong to be angry if it's something that you know that, 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 that you want to use that fuel for something good. But you can't let sin or let anger cause you to sin by allowing it to stay in your spirit for too long. Amen. So let's look at this. There's two Greek words for uh, in the New Testament for anger. One means passion, energy. We talked about that. Passion, energy. And the other one means agitated, boiling. I'm boiling over. I'm so mad, I feel like I'm about to blow up. You've been there, haven't you? Sure you have. We all get irritated to the point where it's like, I can't take it no more. These jokes don't work my last nerve. Amen. 
and we're tired. <laughs> the wife's here, in case you don't know. Uh, the, the, it's, it gets to the point where you, you're just ready to go off. However, going off is not the answer. Hear what I'm saying? It's not the answer. Biblical anger is given is God-given energy intended to help us resolve or solve problems. Excuse me. We need energy to solve problems, and anger is the fuel that gets it done. Examples of biblical, ang biblical anger include David's being upset over hearing about Nathan the prophet sharing an injustice. If you read 2 Samuel chapter 12, you're going to find where David was confronted by Nathan. Nathan had to bring come to him because David had sinned. But he had not confessed his sin. We talked a little bit about this last week. He had not confessed his sin. So God had to send a prophet and use a, 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 a parable, so to speak, about a man who had a, a ewe lamb, a, a female lamb, a little child lamb. And, 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 and the person who took that lamb had many that he did not, he, he could have took his own sheep and fed this wayfaring man who came out of nowhere. He could have fed him the sheep that he, from his flock, but instead he took the one sheep that the man had who they treated like a family member. This is when David sinned with Bathsheba. And so when Nathan told him about this man, the Bible says, David said this man ought to die because of what he did. And so now, Nathan had to say to him, you're the man, David. You did this. See, David could see when he's standing on the outside of the situation how wrong it was. But while he was in it, while he was buried in his, in his anger and his sin, he could not see that it was him who caused this problem. Amen. So we may know what's right for other people, but we have we taken a good look at ourselves? We can always tell other people what to do, but when it comes down to our own anger, how are we, how are we handling it? It's just you and I are just talking. How, you handle, how are you handling your anger? How, do you handle, how are you handling your spirit? Jesus' anger over, uh, uh, over uh, Jesus' anger was angry over some of the Jews who had to follow worship in the temple. Uh, John chapter 2, verse 13 to 17. Jesus was angry because of the, how they defiled the temple. Uh, it says in verse 13, it reads, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went, into, went to Jerusalem. In the temple court, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at the tables exchanging money. I'm reading from the NIV version. Exchanging money. So he made a whip. Jesus, who people like to depict as someone who's soft, with that big, the big brown eyes, and you know, that, that little small, uh, glowing smile and stuff. They, they don't have the right Jesus. Jesus made a whip out of cords and start and drove all the temp, uh, drove them out from the temple courts. Understand, they were in the, the, the outer courts where the Gentiles were able to come to try to reach the God of Israel. And because they were selling and exchanging stuff in the outer courts, the people who came looking for God could not find God because they found the robbers, as Jesus called them, the den of thieves, as Jesus called them. They were in the way of those who needed God. That upset him. That angered him. And it should upset us when we see people who are being hindered from being able to reach God because we have people in the church with attitudes. You have folk who don't want to, who, who just think that it's all about them. Those who want to carry their anger and their pain and not resolve it and then spill out on other people. We should be angry enough to say, we need to stop this mess. We need to do something about it. Jesus made a cord, a whip out of course, and he started running everybody out of the temple. He said, this place is supposed to be a house of prayer. You made it into a den of thieves. You better hear me. They, they, they took the use or what's supposed to be a spiritual use, something that's supposed to be beneficial to those around them, and he turned it into something that was that was demoralizing, that was keeping people out, and it angered God. Anger is not wrong if it's not if it's used appropriately. Anger is not wrong if it's used appropriately. Amen. So let's look at this. Sinful anger. There is such a thing 
as sinful anger. Anger can become sinful when it's motivated, watch this, by pride. You see, essentially that's what it is. Whenever we get angry and we think people owe us something or we want to go and get back at somebody because they said something, did something, and we don't want to let it go, that's pride. How dare you talk to me like that? How dare you treat me like that? Who do you think you are? Do you know who I am? All that kind of stuff. All that is is you, you're speaking from a position of pride. Amen. Right? Okay, I know you don't like that, but it's the truth. You gotta hear me. And you can become sinful when it's motivated by power. I said that. He says, look at James, uh, 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 James uh, 1 uh, to 19, 19 to 21. James 1, 19 to 21. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to hear. Hmm. Quick to listen, he says. Slow to speak. And to be, uh, uh, so to speak, and so to become angry. He said, first, listen. Before you make a decision, before you make a determination about what this person is for, why, why they're saying what they say, take a chance and listen. And listening implies more than just hearing what they say, but understand what's coming from their heart. Take time to ask questions. What do you mean by what you say? Before you go off, ask yourself why. Give them, give them the chance, give them the spirit, the, uh, that, that room for grace and mercy, and say, okay, let me figure out what they're really talking about before I, before I lose it. Because right now I'm here and I don't like, but am I hearing what I should be hearing? And are they saying what, I, what they think I'm, that they're saying? Be quick to hear, slow to speak, think before you open your mouth. Many times we get angry, and we get angry, and the first thing we do, we start saying stuff. We start opening up our mouths. And sometimes you can say things, just watch this, that will destroy relationships and become irreparable. You can't put it back together again because of what you said. Think before you speak. Amen. And look what else James says. He says, because, verse 20, because the human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Our anger Fleshly, sinful anger cannot produce the righteousness of God. We can't make things right with God, for God, because we aren't doing it from the proper motivation. We're doing it from a spirit of pride. Hope you're hearing. Some of us need to put our, put our pride in check before God has to put it in check for us. Yeah. Sinful anger is, we know it's sinful anger when it's unproductive and thus distorts God's purposes. When it distorts God's purpose, it's unproductive, it's sinful anger. Look what it says here in 1 Corinthians 10.31. So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. If I'm doing it because I'm prideful, if I'm doing it because I'm angry, if I'm doing it because I'm mad, if I'm doing it because somebody upset me, I'm not bringing glory to God. You can't bring glory to God when you're walking around in sinful anger, which again is really pride. And I said to y'all earlier that some of us, the reason why we have this, this, this uh, 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 anger is because we have unresolved pain in our lives. Somebody says something, somebody did something to you a long time ago, and you told yourself, I'm never going to let them do this to me. I'm never going to let somebody make me feel this way. But every single time somebody says something, as I said earlier, you allow them to get you upset. So now you're in bondage to them. They say something, you react. They do something, you react. They, 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 they take something, you react. And now here you are in bondage to them because every time they say, do, or take, you react in anger. And God says, I have to, see, I have to let you know something. Because you're walking in pride, I have to resist you. I can't even, I can't bless you in that condition. Because the Bible says God resists the proud. Y'all better hear what I'm saying. He resists the pride. I don't want any one of you to feel like that, that to feel like you can't get over this because you can. I'm, I'm a witness. I still have struggles with it from time to time, but I'm nowhere near what I once was. Nowhere near. Right now, I'm standing up here with sweat. Before, back in the day, I'll be mad about that. Amen. <laughs> Crazy. Right? He says, look what it says here. Um, it's, when anger is allowed to linger, Ephesians 4, 26, 27. We know it's sinful when we allow it to linger. We already said, 
we already read this when we talked about don't let the don't let uh, your anger in your anger do not sin, uh, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. That means we let it linger for a while. Think about that. I'm mad. I'm thinking about it. I think nobody got me mad. I'm ready to go off. But I ain't gonna say I'm, I'm just gonna I'm just not gonna say nothing. I'm gonna just act like everything okay. But every time you see him, you're upset. And it starts to swell. Before you know it, you're not sleeping right, your stomach's upset, you have headaches, and it's all because you've been carrying unresolved anger. It becomes sinful because you can't glorify God in that condition. You can't really do the will of God in that condition. Amen? So, Paul tells us to let that go. All right? The one obvious sign that anger has turned to sin is when instead of attacking the problem at hand, listen to me now, we're talking. Instead of attacking the problem at hand, we attack the wrongdoer. We attack those who think who we believe is the wrongdoer, right? Instead of accepting responsibility for allowing our anger to take control of our actions, we blame the victims. It's in the text over in Genesis chapter 2, or chapter 4, I'm sorry. Cain and Abel. You know the story. Do you get time? Read Genesis chapter 4, verses 2 to 8. It says, Now Abel kept, kept the flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as, the, as an offering to the Lord. They both brought offerings, right? Uh, the Bible says, Abel also brought uh, an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on, on Abel and his offering, but on Cain, his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. He became very angry because God did not accept his offering, but he accepted Abel's offering, right? Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, listen to that, if you do what is right, if you do what your brother did and bring the proper offering, he says, watch this, he says, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Wouldn't I also applaud you? Wouldn't I say your, your offering would be accepted? Wouldn't I bring you into the fold? He says, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. In other words, sin is like a hungry lion crouching, waiting to pounce on you. That's what happens when we allow ourselves to go with unchecked sin and unresolved, unresolved anger, and we get watch to start to blame the victim rather than face the problem. And, and rather than fixing what needs to be fixed, we are here getting angry, and we want to do something to the person rather than dealing with the problem. Right? It says, now Cain was... Uh, uh, said to his brother, to his brother Abel, Cain said, now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. It led to murder. Unresolved anger led to murder of his own blood, his own people. That's why you think some, some families can't get along. Because somebody's angry and they haven't dealt with it. Every time they come to a, 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 a barbecue, a picnic, whatever, when they come to anything to have a family gathering, somebody's going to start something. Why? Because they haven't dealt with the anger that's in their spirit. Is it you? Are you the one? We're just talking. Just having a conversation. i give you one more and then we're going to move on to some solutions. Uh, another example is Jonah. Now Jonah is an enigma. It doesn't make sense because he was a, he was God's mouthpiece, God's a uh, 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 prophet, and God told him to go to Nineveh. He got on the boat and started heading to Tarshish. You know the story. Because he didn't like the Ninevites, he didn't want God to save them, so he decided he's going to go in the opposite direction. But we know God. Uh, caused a storm and caused a fish to come and swallow him up, take him to the bottom of the sea. He prayed. God spewed him right out, had the, the fish spew him right out on the shores of Nineveh because he was going to do what God said do, regardless of how he felt. 
God put him in a position, you're going to do like I said. You're going to go out there and you're going to tell the Ninevites that I come, I come here to save them. He didn't want to do that. He was angry. Look what it says in the text. Verse 1 says, but to Jonah, he, it, this seemed very wrong. He didn't like that. He didn't like that God wanted to save the Ninevites. He had, he had a hatred for them, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said after they had repented? After the entire city repented, here's what uh, uh, Jonah had to say to God. He prayed and said, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That that is what I tried to, to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I didn't want this to happen. I tried to delay it. I didn't want you to save them. I knew that you would be, you would be gracious and compassionate you, and slow to anger and abounding in love. He knew this all. He knew all of this about God, right? Slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life. Now, listen to that. He was so angry. He said, "Just kill me." Take me out. You saved them, but kill me. I did what you said. Now look what the results are. They're saved. They gave their life to you. They all repented. From the king all the way down to the youngest. And so, he said, is it better for me to, to die than to live? But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? He said, but Cain and... and Listen to me. Both Cain and Jonah's anger was unjust and sinful. Cain's anger led to murder, while Jonah's anger revealed his, revealed his hatred and his prejudice towards the people of Nineveh. Sinful anger will express itself in the most horrific way possible. That's why it's imperative that we deal with it quickly before it takes root. If you have not dealt with the unresolved uh, 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 anger in your life, it will take root before you know it. Well, let me put it like this. There's folk in jail right now. The folk went to the gas chamber. The folk went to the electric chair because they did not deal with their unresolved anger. She starts talking. Let me go on and move to how to handle anger in, from the biblical perspective. One, by recognizing and admitting our prideful anger and our wrong handling of anger as sin. Proverbs 28 and 13, whosoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. If you want God to show you mercy, if you want God to get to, to watch this, get this off you, get this ache and pain off your body from the sin that you're carrying because of anger. He says you've got to confess it, you've got to renounce it. Amen. You got to let this thing go. You got to recognize that I'm walking in prideful anger, and that is sin before God. If we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John, uh, first John nine, one, verse one and nine. First John one and nine. So God said, if you confess this, that means agree with me, say what it is, and don't turn around trying to sugarcoat it. Just tell me, come at me clean, and let me know this is what I'm doing, Lord, and I'm sorry for it. The guy says, okay, I, I, that's all I want. I just want you to come clean, because I want to bless you. I want you. I want you to know that I love you, and I want to put you in a position where you can be. Where, where you can receive more from me and more of me, but you, your anger is preventing me from doing it. Your sinful anger is prevent, preventing me from doing that. Let's look at something else. See, when we talk about I'm confessing, I'm no longer blaming other people. I'm not shifting blame. I'm not doing what, uh, uh, you know, I'm not doing what Cain did. I'm not doing what, what uh, uh, Adam did. I'm not doing what Eve did. I'm not shifting blame. I'm saying it's me, oh Lord, me that's in need of prayer. You ever hear me? So look at what else happened. Often, the consequences are uncontrolled. I already said that is irreparable. Let's look at something else. Under the, under the banner of how to handle anger from a biblical perspective, by seeing God in my trial, by seeing that God is at work somewhere, God has to sometimes watch this chisel us. All right? It's like you have a stone, and he's a master artist. You're the stone. He's the master artist, a master sculpture. 
He sees what your potential is. He sees what you're capable of becoming. And so in order to extract what's in you, he has to send something along to chisel you. He takes a hammer and a tool, a chisel, and begin to chop, to, to whittle away, to chop away the, the exterior because that's only the outside. That's what people see. But what's in you, God says, I'm trying to pull out. Other people see the outward appearance. Man, see the outward appearance. They see the face, but I see what's in your heart. And I know you're better than that. I know you don't want to walk around in anger. I know it's because you're hurt. Now, let me help you get through that. Confess it so we can move on. Amen. Right? Look what uh, James said. James says this. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. This is James 1. Verses 2 and 4. Consider pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. God says, let me work on you. Let me, let, let my, my, my process work. Let the word work on you so that you can become better. So that you can become more mature. So you can become complete. That word complete means mature in the spirit. You're not, you're not there yet, but you're better than you were. You're growing up. Understand something. When you allow uncontrolled anger, we're really acting like, you ever see little children, little two-year-olds? They call them terrible twos for a reason. They're out of control. And God says, I'm looking at you. And I know you're out of control because you won't let your anger go. Look what it says here in, uh, we're talking about uh, seeing God in our trials. He said this. He said over in read Romans chapter 8 verse 28 to 29. Read that when you write that down. Read that when you, when you get a chance. But I also want you to see Genesis 15 and 20. Alright? It says when, when uh, Jacob talked to his brothers about what they did to him, he said this. He said this. You intended to harm me. Right? You intended evil for me, but God meant it for my, Joseph, God meant it for my good. You tried to harm me, and he said, but God intended it for my good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. He was chomped, thrown in the pit. He ended up in Potiphar's house, lied on in Potiphar's house, ended up in prison. But before you knew it, he was in the palace. He went through all that trouble, but watch this. He never let the trouble trouble him. He didn't allow the pain of being rejected by his, by his family, being sold out by his family. He did not let that get to the point where he had it, held it in his heart. So God was able to use him while he was in the prison, while he was in Potiphar's house. And then he became second in command because, uh, in Egypt. And he was there at the point, as a point man to save many folk, to keep many folk alive. Imagine what, what have you sacrificed on the altar of your anger? What, what authority, what power, what, what gifts, what riches have you, have you sacrificed on the altar of your fire of your anger? God says, I have so much for you, but I can't get it to you because you're too busy sacrificing everything to your anger. Don't you think it's time for you to let that go? He says here, let me give you some practical steps and I'm out the way. He said, first of all, first of all, be honest when you speak to people. Be honest. Ephesians 4, 15 and 25. Write that down. Ephesians 4, 15 and 25. People cannot read your mind. So we must speak the truth in love. Yes, you can tell people you're upset. Yes, you can tell them they made you angry about that. But it's not for the purpose of just informing them. It's for the purpose of trying to restore the relationship. And you say it in such a way, says, listen, you may not understand, you may not know that what you said really offended me. I don't know if you meant that, but if, you, if, if even if you did, I'm not going to hold it against you. I just want you to know that I think we, we're better than this. I think we've been through, much, too, too, been through too much together before this situation occurred. So let's try to be better people. Let's, let's, us, if I said something that made you feel bad or uh, upset you in some way, I apologize to you. 
You may not be the one that did it, but you apologize because you want to restore the relationship. Because that's what God expects, particularly between those who say they're saved. So we speak the truth in love. All right? Another thing is, we must stay current. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. We already read that. We must not allow what is bothering us to build up until we lose control. We already talked about that. It is important to deal with it as it bothers you, what is bothering, bothering us, before it reaches critical mass. Before it blows up, deal with it. As a matter of fact, tell yourself, deal with it. Look yourself in the mirror, deal with it. You wake up, in the, you, wake up and you still have that on your mind, deal with it. Don't let it fester. Because once a wound is open, some wounds become infected. And when they become infected, you need some extra stuff to clear it up. And some wounds can't be cleared up overnight. Matter of fact, none of this is going to happen overnight. It's going to take you consistently pushing, consistently looking at, consistently praying, consistently uh, surrendering, consistently giving this day up and saying, I'm not going to let this bother me anymore until it finally becomes rhema in your spirit. Finally, finally you have it so you're no longer allowing it to mess with you. Look at this. I'm almost done. Attack the problem instead of the person. Attack the problem instead of the person. Do not let your unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. This is what it says in Ephesians 4 and 29. Unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others, but building others up to their, to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. My words should be encouraging rather than tearing down. When you're angry, you want to hurt people. When you feel hurt, you want to hurt. Hurting people hurt people. And God says time for you to stop allowing yourself to be hurt and stop allowing yourself to be angry because you're hurt. Bring it before the Lord. He said, cast all your care upon me for I care for you. It's time for us to let this go because what your life is going to be unproductive. You may, you may have all the glitz and glamour that you may want, but when it comes to the things of God, you'll be, you, watch this, You'll, you'll, you'll be uh, like a person who has been in a wasteland, a wilderness, and your, your, your spirit is dried up because you haven't really given God what he wants the most, and that's you. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. That's Ephesians 4 and 31. Let me wrap this up. So God is saying... Also, act, don't react. Act, don't react. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, uh -oh, forgiving each other just as Christ has gave you. Whenever we think about not forgiving people for the wrong they've done, we're saying, Jesus, your forgiveness doesn't mean much to me. He forgave us, so he expects us to forgive someone else. You don't forgive people who've done nothing to you, because you had nothing to for them to, to, to you had nothing to forgive them for. It's the people who have offended you that you need to forgive. We offend God every day by our actions, by our thoughts. But he says, I love you enough to watch this blanket you with forgiveness because I sent my son to the cross. To die for all humanity. I, the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So therefore, it's not the problem with the sin, it's the problem with the son. We have not, if we haven't accepted the son to, 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 uh, uh, to help us through the various things in life, if we haven't really accepted Jesus Christ so we have a connection with God, so we can learn to forgive and we can learn to love, because it doesn't come from us, it has to come from God. So he has to come through us, work on us, and work through us to love the people who are unlovable. Which, by the way, is rare. We can be unlovable from time to time because of our attitudes. Amen. Just talking. We're just talking. All right. So let me let me wrap this up. It says, um, if your anger stems from certain relationships, if your anger stems from some certain relationships, sometimes your anger leads to uh, leads us to recognize 
that certain people are unsafe for us. Certain people you just need to get away from. Because they consistently want to pull out the worst in you. They want to be, they want to be negative and nasty all the time. The Bible says that, that filthy communication corrupts some good men. If we're not willing to recognize that I'm around some, some toxic people, that's what's fueling my anger. You have to learn to get away. Amen? And then finally, we must act to solve our part of the problem. See, sometimes you, you, you know, you play the role in it, and that other person may not want to hear what you have to say, but you must act to solve your part. Let me do what I can to fix this problem. Even if you turn around and it cuts you out, don't you go back and do the same thing. I tried. Lord, you know my heart. I came with, 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 with some, with, uh, some uh, uh, holy intentions, some loving intentions, and this is how they responded. So I'm just letting you know, I'm clean of this. My hands are clean. That's what God wants. Try to do your part. It says in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone around you. If you can, you may not be able to do that all the time. Look what else it says in verse 19. He says, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. Vengeance is, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Let God work on them. Let God take revenge. If they don't want to follow the suit and, and, and ask for forgiveness and your peace up and go and, and try to walk this thing out and work it out, and they want to continue to walk in a way that's going to cause anger and toxicity in your life, he says, you know what? You leave them alone. Leave them to me. Leave them to me. Because God knows how to fix somebody that's broken better than we can. Because broken people oftentimes break people. So God said, let me deal with this. So in closing, we cannot control how others act or respond. But we can make the changes that, that's needed to, to, to do our part. Overcoming a temper is not accomplished overnight. But through prayer, Bible study, and reliance upon God's Holy Spirit, ungodly anger can be overcome. I'm a witness. We may have allowed anger to become entrenched in our lives by habitual practice, but we can also practice responding correctly until that, un in the responding, responding correctly until that too becomes a habit. Until our practice of doing what's right becomes a habit, once we consistently do what's right, it would be a habit just like the old practices were. Just like our old attitude was. It was practice. And we, and we knew how to do it. We knew how to play that game. But God says, you need new practice. You need a new, you need a new focus, a new direction. Start practicing forgiveness. Start practicing holy living. Start practicing relinquishing anger. Start practicing glorifying God. Glorifying God. And if we do that, God will respond to you. Everybody else can be messed up. He'll respond to you. Because you made up your mind. I'm going to let this go. I'm going to do everything I can to glorify God. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that I don't let anger rule me. So, in closing, I just want to let you know that next week is our final class. And we're going to be discussing the other, the last of the three, which is probably one of the most prevalent, is fear. We're going to talk about fear next week. So come back. Every time you look at this, if you hear something you, hear something you like, tell somebody. Make sure you follow us on Facebook, Instagram. We're here in Port Norris, uh, 1130 on, uh, uh, when, on Sunday. And we're in Port and Vina at 1030, or I mean 930 in Vina. And we're here in both locations for Bible study at 7 o'clock on the dot. We get started at 7, we end at 8. So come on out and join us. Don't sit home and let the devil beat you up. You have friends and family who can help you through. So God bless you. Let me pray for you as we go out.
Father God in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord. I pray whoever's listening to this, Lord, that whatever words that were said, Lord, that they find something that can help them to overcome their anger. Lord, we just want to give you the praise. I thank you for allowing me to be the vessel, the conduit that you're using for this class. And we just want to give you all the glory. Now, bind every spirit over them, their lives. I want to hinder them from being able to hear and graft the word which is able to save their soul. Help us, Lord, to not be just healers, but be doers. And, Lord, may this word, Lord, be... Uh, May it touch many lives. May it touch many lives. Those who have walked around anger, may they be freed from it. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. See you next week.